All right, back to buffers. So as we just mentioned, buffers are hydrogen ion reservoirs that take up or release hydrogen as needed. So these are chemicals in a water solution that can absorb or release hydrogen, acting as a reservoir, a source. So let's look at a simple example. Here is water interacting with carbon dioxide. Kind of like what happens in a cloud. We have an atmosphere made up of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and other things. Well, when water droplets form in a cloud, gases dissolve in those water droplets. So there's oxygen in a water droplet. And there's carbon dioxide in a water droplet. And sometimes we intentionally add a bunch more carbon dioxide. How do we do that? Or why do we do that? Soda. What is the bubbles released from your soda? Carbon dioxide bubbles. But when the dissolved carbon dioxide interacts with water, it forms carbonic acid. And you'll notice two hydrogens, two hydrogens, three carbons, one, two, three carbons, and, or, excuse me, not carbons, uh, oxygens. Uh, two hydrogens, three oxygens, and one carbon. So the entire water and carbon dioxide molecule recombine to form carbonic acid. Does it all form carbonic acid? No. You'll notice that between these two white boxes, there's a double arrow pointing left and right, meaning that the reaction is on a, an equilibrium, a balance going back and forth between these two states. Some of it's water and carbon dioxide, some of it's carbonic acid, and they just go back and forth. Well, once you have carbonic acid in a water solution, some of that carbonic acid will give up a hydrogen ion. That's why we call it an acid. What is an acid? Something that when put in water will come apart, giving up some hydrogen ions. Increase the hydrogen ion concentration of that water, making the water acidic. It also has a double-headed arrow between these two boxes. So all three of these boxes are in a drop of water in a cloud or in a lake. All three of these things are going on all the time. I have some water, I have some carbon dioxide, I have some carbonic acid, I have some bicarbonate, which is carbonic acid minus a hydrogen ion, and some free hydrogen ions. So if I have all three of these boxes, all five of these compounds in a water droplet in a cloud at any one time, is it acid or base? Is that water turned acid or is it turned base? It's turned acid. Because do I have any hydroxide ions here? No. Do I have any free hydrogen ions floating around? I do. So this is why rainwater is slightly acid because there's a little bit of hydrogen ions given up in that drop of water because of the dissolved carbon dioxide gas. But this, this is a weak reaction. All of these things are in the water at the same time. So carbonic acid is an acid because it can break down, giving up a hydrogen ion. And bicarbonate is a base because it can combine with a hydrogen ion, forming carbonic acid, taking that hydrogen ion back out of solution. Okay, so I have acid and base at the same time in the solution, but the only one that has impacted the pH at this point is the carbonic acid that gave up its hydrogen ion. And so I've got more hydrogen ions than I started with. And so the rainwater is slightly acid. 
But because these reactions aren't complete, if I have a low hydrogen ion concentration, what if I add a little bit of base and I get rid of these hydrogen ions because I add a drop of a base to my water solution? What's gonna happen? Whatever carbonic acid is in solution is going to give up more of its hydrogen ions. If I take away some of these hydrogen ions, more hydrogen ions will be released. If I add more hydrogen ions, I add a little drop of more acid and I increase the hydrogen ions, what's gonna happen? The excess hydrogen ions that I just added will combine with the carbonic acid, or excuse me, the bicarbonate, they'll combine with the bicarbonate forming carbonic acid. It'll take them out. Bottom line is if I have a buffer, it's a chemical that if I add more hydrogen ions, the buffer will absorb some of what I added. Not all of it, but it'll absorb some of what I added. If I take away hydrogen ions, the buffer will release more hydrogen ions, replacing some that I just took away. Effectively, a buffer is a chemical that resists changes to the pH. Okay? A buffer is a substance that will resist changes to pH. And this is important in soils. If I need to change the pH, let's say I've got a pH of 7.2 and I want to grow something at pH 7.6 and I've got 10 acres. I don't have enough information yet. I know I've got 10 acres of soil to change. I know I need to go from 7.2 to 7.6. How do I get there? How much stuff do I have to add in order to get it from 7.2 up to 7.6? It depends on how much buffering capacity my soil has because my soil is going to resist my effort to change the pH based on how much buffering it has. So, please pay attention here. Buffering capacity is the ability to withstand pH changes or pH fluctuations. And buffering capacity is low. Pay attention because some people get this, this graphic wrong. P, uh, excuse me, buffering capacity is low in the following conditions. It's low in sandy soils and it's low when clay and organic matter are also low. Buffering capacity is low in sandy soils or in soils that have low clay and low organic matter. Okay, sandier soils, low buffering capacity. Low clay concentration, low organic matter content, low buffering capacity. On the other side, you have high buffering capacity in soils that have large amounts of clay or large amounts of organic matter or both. Because clays and organic matter hold on to these buffering chemicals. It's not that the clay is a buffer. The clay is not a buffer. Organic matter is not a buffer. The thing here that makes the difference, clay and organic matter hold on to these chemicals that are buffers. And so these buffer chemicals accumulate in soils that have high clay and high organic matter. So if I have a pH 7.2 soil and I need to get it to 7.6 and I've got a low buffering capacity soil, I'm gonna add less material to change my pH. If I've got a clay soil, or especially if I've got a high organic content clay soil, I need to add a bunch more material to bump my pH up, all right? So there are lots of causes for why pH can change in your soil, um, but it, you know, it, it becomes more acid when you add hydrogens. Where are the hydrogens gonna come from? Primarily from organic materials, 
decomposing, so leftover crop residues, cover cropping, composts, all kinds of organic things. Anything organic tends to acidify the soils, um, which also tends to release sulfur because sulfur is a, an essential component of all plants and animals. It's one of the 17 essential elements. And when sulfur is released, it also produces some sulfuric acid as a byproduct. So organic materials tend to acidify soils. Um, also, most fertilizers tend to be acidifying. There are some exceptions, but most fertilizers tend to acidify the soil, especially on organic production systems because all of your fertilizers are organically based. Therefore, they're decomposing materials which are going to acidify the soils. Uh, parent materials with aluminum also tend to acidify the soils. I'm not going to get into the chemistry of aluminum. Aluminum is somewhat complex. If you get into soils, you need to know about aluminum because aluminum is uh, an important component in the potential hydrogen equation. So soils become alkaline when you add OH or anything that absorbs the hydrogen ions. So there are things called liming materials, lime or liming materials. T typically those are things containing calcium and magnesium, but not all things that contain uh, calcium and magnesium are liming materials. So there are things like burned lime, calcite or calcitic limestone, uh, dolomite, slag, those are all liming materials. There's something called gypsum and that is not a liming material. It contains calcium, and sulfur. And so the chemistry of gypsum is somewhat complicated when it comes to pH. And so even though it might make your pH move one way or the other a little bit, it's not considered a liming material. Um, so the salts that would cause pHs to uh, change uh, some fertilizers, that should say some, most of uh, most of the fertilizers are actually acidifiers, but some can be uh, pH raisers. Soil amendments, lime and liming materials. Yes, gypsum, as I already mentioned, it's not a liming material, but it will have an impact on pH. Just it can move your pH slightly in one direction or another. It's complicated. And even the parent materials, the rocks from which your soil is forming, can release calcium and magnesium. So now it's time to actually adjust the pH. You need uh, a pH to be different than what your soil currently is. What do you do? You need to know the current pH. What is the pH of my soil now? What is the buffering capacity of my soil? Um, an example, most Arizona soils or many soils in Arizona contain large amounts of calcium carbonate, which is free lime. And because of that, it's constantly buffering the soil because of the rock. The original soil itself is buffering to pH 7.5 to 8. How the heck are you going to acidify a soil that the soil itself is buffering itself at a higher pH? It's not a good idea to try to grow an acid loving plant in, in those conditions. You'll be spending all your money on acid treatments constantly to try to keep the pH down. You're better off growing a crop that's adapted to that soil. So things that you can add, lime or liming material, if your soil is too acidic and you need to make it more basic. So I've got a soil that's 5.8 and I need to bring it to be closer to neutral or I've got a pH that's, even if it's already slightly alkaline, I got a pH 7.2 and I need to move it up to 7.5 or 7.8. That's still moving it more basic. I'm gonna use some sort of lime or liming material. And so here's a list of some of the liming materials. I've already mentioned a couple of them, but you need to pick a liming material that's appropriate for your soil. It's gonna partly be based on cost, what is available in your area, and also what other things are going on in your soil. So there might be a liming material that contains a lot of magnesium, for example. Uh, dolomitic limestone has uh, 
uh, high levels of magnesium and calcium. And if I'm in Hollister, in certain parts of Hollister, one of the problems that I might have in some Hollister soils is high magnesium. I don't want to use a magnesium lining material if I already have too much magnesium in my soil. The soil can almost become like toothpaste when it gets wet. When it's so high in magnesium, it's a problem. So I'm going to want to pump in a bunch of calcium and calcium-based liming material to counteract that excess of magnesium. So you have to take into consideration the makeup of your soil when selecting a liming material to use. And any good soil analysis laboratory will be able to give you good advice on that. Now, if I have a too basic soil, my soil is pH 7.5 and I want it 6.5, uh, I wanna move the pH down, it's too basic, I want a more acidic soil, I'm gonna generally add sulfur or sulfates. And the two materials that are most common are ammonium sulfate or granular elemental sulfur. Ammonium sulfate is also ammonium, which is a nitrogen fertilizer. So it's expensive, but you're killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. You're adding the ammonium to feed the plants for their nitrogen needs and, oops, and um, the sulfur to get the pH down. Um, now that's not something you can use in organic farming. Ammonium sulfate is a no-no for organic farming. So you would have to go to granular elemental sulfur if you're organic. Um, but no matter what you're using, the acidification of soils is expensive and it doesn't last very long. You've got to keep at it. You've got to keep adding things, keep adding, keep adding. And so it just keeps chipping away at your profits. Um, but Sometimes it's what you have to do. It's part of the equation that you have to consider when you're determining what crops do I wanna grow in this particular soil? Does it make sense to grow something that's gonna require me to utilize an expensive uh, acidification product? Now, a lot of people use acidifiers in their production, so it's not a, a done deal that, oh, I need to acidify, therefore, uh, I can't make money that way. That's not true at all. You just have to take it into consideration. So now it's time to take a sample. You don't just go out and dig a shovel full out of the field. You need to take samples from around different areas in your field and composite them and bring that into the lab. Now, how many samples across how big of an area? There are a lot of factors to consider. I would definitely suggest you work with your um, your company or the laboratory that's doing the samples to make sure you have a good soil sample collecting strategy and compositing strategy. Now, for some research purposes, you might wanna keep things more separate. Uh, the more individual separate samples you have, the more information you have, but the more it's gonna cost because you have to test each sample separately. For most production purposes, you'll pick a, a region of the field and composite several samples out of the region. And there are special probes. You can get these uh, long skinny augers. You poke them down into the soil, give it a quick twist, yank it out of the soil and bang it into a bucket and a, a sample of soil will come out with it. And you can just go and take these soil samples periodically all around the field and then composite them by mixing the bucket and then taking a subsample out of the bucket and sending that to your lab. So you collect the soil sample. Once you've taken the soil sample, if you're doing the testing yourself, you'll make a paste by adding water. You don't want to get it totally soaked. There's different uh, procedures. Sometimes you do uh, a standard 100 grams of soil to 100 milliliters of water, a one-to-one -one ratio. That's uh, what some labs do. Others mix it to a certain consistency, which would be um, kind of a, a slurry like pancake batter thickness of a paste. Um, make sure you calibrate your meter while the soil paste is sitting. You generally wanna leave it sitting for 
20, 30 minutes to get the pH components to dissolve and, and mix into the, the water. Calibrate your soil, run a sample, record your results. And that's it. That is soil pH.